Welcome to US 2360, I'm Neil Socant. Right now I'm reporting to you from Haiti, from the Department of the West, in a locality called Duplassy. We are in the countryside, only 20 minutes away from Leogan, which was the center of the earthquake three years ago. And only a couple of months ago, in October, 2012, this place was hit again by Hurricane Sandy. We are here to find out about the specific problem of the countryside in Haiti. That's why we're going to meet with Dr. Robert Daniel, who can explain us more about this specific problem. Hi, Robert. Hi. How are you? How are you, sir? Good to see you. It's a pleasure. So, you are a Tucci volunteer, but you're also a nation doctor. Can you say a few words about what happened here after Hurricane Sandy? Hurricane Sandy really hit the community in a very huge fashion. Uh, the people were... A lot of crops got destroyed. As you know, this is an agricultural community and most people are living from the agriculture. So they live from the agriculture, not only they eat the food, but they also, when the surplus is sold. So they hit the, a lot of areas were flooded, so uh, it was really a disaster. What do you tell people when, you, when you're here, try, as a Tsuchi volunteer, to, to talk to people and see exactly what their needs are? What we have been doing is to assess the needs of these people, but most of them uh, have a problem with uh, finances because they have nutritional problems. Because when we do the clinics here, we can see that the people cannot fulfill the medication, their need for medication. And we can see that most of the people have malnutrition and they have difficulty eating and they have difficulty filling out their prescription. So what we try to, help, to tell them is to find the help in order to rebuild their infrastructure and also their plantation because they mostly grow crops like uh, corn, bananas, plantains and um, beans. So they are really depleted of all their uh, production means. After the earthquake, people usually focused on Port-au-Prince, the capital, and we saw a lot about Port-au-Prince, the capital. Right now we are an hour away from the capital. and. Here, what happened, we, it's hard to think what happened, to imagine what happened after the earthquake in the countryside, really. That's really a problem because a lot of people got to Port-au-Prince and they see so much Port-au-Prince devastated after the earthquake and they thought they, that that's where they can bring the help. But here being so far away, a lot of help go to the easy way. It's very far and the, there is no roads, so people don't get to all these areas. And the, they, the earthquake affected here mostly in the infrastructures. As you can see, some clinics are damaged and this kind of thing. But Sandy is different because it destroys the crops. So when you destroy the infrastructure as for the housing it is also difficult but here the sandy destroy their mean of production the way they earn their living so it's in a way it is more devastating th than the earthquake so what are now the immediate needs and the for the future if they want to rebuild if they want to start growing food again what are the needs as a volunteer I made the assessment the assessment need to be resolved in two ways you have the short term because the people need some food to eat because there is a problem with nutrition they need some medication to fulfill their medication needs and also they need a long term they need to credit in order to rebuild their infrastructure their plantations so they can get back to work because what is really important is to get them back to work so they don't go out and ask for money again every time. So then also that so, so they can keep their dignity. They want to go back to work instead of somebody giving them all the time. So right now we have made the assessment. What we need is the help for short term and the long term credit for these people to grow back their crops. Well, thank you so much. And we can go see the situation not only here but also in Pearl Prince to compare the two and see exactly what is new today, three years after the earthquake. So let's have a look at the global situation of Haiti three years after the earthquake. The only road to get to the isolated villages of the mountains in Leogan is a river. The same river that during Sandy devastated the entire valley. For days the road wasn't practicable because many of these century-old trees fell down, leaving the population in the same situation they were after the earthquake. That's the reason why a group of Tsuchi volunteers from Pearl Prince went to assess the needs of the residents. It's a very complex situation. It is the ground 
the ground place of the mountains. So people live in agglomerations. They don't live in like a village. There used to be a school and a clinic. The school deserved almost 30,000 people. All the kids from all the rural areas from the mountains used to come to school here. They are really forgotten because nobody could go to the hill. That's why we use this center. But since the earthquake, the center was destroyed. So everybody live in the world, in the in the mountains, and no communication, no help, and nothing. Many people have died. Many were pregnant women. Someone had referred a case to me of a woman who was pregnant, and she died from a lack of care. We had a delivery room in here, but is no longer in use. So now people here use herbal medicine, and women give birth at home. Sometimes they call me at 1 a.m. to ask me, we have some problems, what can we do? We cannot go to the hospital, there is no motorcycle taxi. She has to walk all the way down from her house, then in the valley she has to take a motorcycle taxi to go to the hospital. But in her condition, and as the road is really bad, she can lose her baby in just a minute. Before the earthquake, she would have been able to have a baby here, but now she has to go to the city. That's why we need a space for the patient and the pregnant woman. Then, on a second plan, we need an educational structure as well as agricultural help, because this is the only thing that people do here, the only way to make a living. All the prices have increased. For example, there is no beans left, so the price of beans is so high. The situation has become really hard for us, even the kids. We have a hard time getting the money to send them to school. We have to eat rice. That's the only thing we have now. And yet, we don't have that much left. Right now, I can't plant again. Because I don't have the money to buy the seeds again, we are waiting for God. There are many places like Leogan in Haiti, and there is still a lot to be done in the countryside, where the main problem remains isolation from the basic needs, food, education and health. Only two hours away from the mountains, in the capital Port-au-Prince, the ruins of the presidential palace are still being cleaned, when the president, Michel Martelly, and its government work from temporary buildings. That's when Abba Martelly volé, that's when against Martelly thief, in English, you know. In France, it's just Abba Martelly volé, you know. But there are some people, they're angry against Martelly. There are beaucoup de gens n'aiment pas Martelly, you know. To tell you the truth, you know, why right now, I can say I love Matilda, I don't have no job right now, you know? But, you know, just as an artist, you know, I'm an artist, you know, I make paint, you know, that's my, that's my work, you know. My name is Renaudin, that's me, Carlos Renaudin, that's my name right here. I make paint to survive, you know, je fais des tableaux pour nourrir mes enfants. Yeah, I'm a pain to survive because why right now no job in this country and the, the market is become high because the rich people why right now they don't work together with Matele. They work against Matele. They try to force Matele out. I don't want to leave this country, you know, but we need him for now, you know, because he has dream. That's why I like him, but he's surrounded by bad people. Matele has a big dream. He wants to change this country. He already just spend money on education, you know. He try to just have like healthcare, you know, and you can see travel a lot or now to try to collect the head by many countries in the world. There's no progress so far. We still live in the tents, and when it rains, it collapses. Everyone is under the water, and we have to start over again. There's no life here. There's no hope for us to go away. Sometimes we see organizations coming, but nothing has changed. The situation has become worse because without work, you can't do anything. We 
with a population of over a million inhabitants and an employment rate higher than 60%, Port-au-Prince remains three years after the earthquake in a precarious situation. Even near the rebuilt neighborhoods, water shortage is still an issue. And even owners of small businesses are struggling to make ends meet. I'm selling food products, but after the earthquake, as all the stores were collapsed, it was impossible to buy or sell anything. So for a long time, I have stuck because I couldn't buy my products or sell them. It's not working that well, you know. It's slow, but I made the minimum I need. I have to pay the school for the kids, but you know I can't complain because there are people in much worse situation than me. We are here in Port-au-Prince in a camp called Delma 10. Delma here this camp has been created three years ago right after the earthquake. Three years later 1300 families are still living here. I used to have a small business, but when the earthquake happened, I lost everything. I had friends here, so I came to this camp. When Sandy happened, oh my God, we had a lot of water coming in from every corner of the house. But thank God, the tarp on the top stayed, so we didn't have too much broken. It was only water. I have three children, but she is the only one with me here. The two others, they had to go with the family of their father, but the little one-year-old girl stayed. I have her here in the camp. What's the most difficult for me is I don't have any income. I don't even have a little money for my basic needs. This is what is tough for me, just like everyone else. If only I had a job, I could have something to help us, but now it's really difficult. The situation of the country, especially the social aspect, it causes many troubles. Here, people don't have access to anything, like education, or economically, they don't have anything on the horizon. Right after the earthquake here in Haiti, many NGOs came. Some were told to come here, so they did, and told us about many projects around the camp. But unfortunately, for most of them, it stayed only projects. They didn't realize they never did what they promised us. That is why today the situation of this camp, especially, is so complicated. Because that's the 21st century. A country, its population, its youth shouldn't live in these bestial conditions. You have to come in this country, you know. Don't send money, but come to, to do something by your own head, you know. That's you can believe in that, you know. Come in this country, make program in this country, and then we can survive, you know. This is how we end our focus on the general situation of Haiti. Right now we are at the airport of Pearl Prince, about to take off for New York City to see how Asians, residents of the United States, are looking at their country 3,000 miles away from here. Madame, Monsieur, bonsoir et bienvenue à notre rendez-vous de tous les soirs. Vous êtes sur Radio Soleil, 97.9 FM, SIA, Radio Soleil, la radio de la communauté. My name is Rico Dupree and I'm the general manager uh, for Radio Soleil, the um, Haitian radio station. We broadcast from our base uh, main studio in Brooklyn and our program goes to the Tri-State area, New York, New Jersey and in Connecticut. I have a daily show at 9 p.m. where I uh, comment on the news of the day, international or American news and Haitian news. There was a time when, when it, uh, it was almost exclusively Haiti, but as the community grows, as the community becomes uh, integrated into the American society, then they have concern. One Sunday night, it was 11 o'clock, I was tired, I was ready to go home. And then uh, a yellow cab dropped a Haitian man in front of my radio. The guy could barely walk. 
uh, it was cold, but he didn't have shoes. Uh, the taxi driver said, well, the, the, I found this guy at the airport. He don't know where he's going. There's nobody to welcome him. I thought of you, guy. So he brought the guy here. I asked the guy, where are you going? He says, I don't know. My sister, my, my his cousin, whatever was supposed to be at the airport for him. And the person wasn't there. He's diabetic. And I see. I asked him, did you take your medication? He said, no, I haven't taken my medication. I said, why? He said, they were lost during the, the earthquake. I said, but that, that was a month and a half ago. He said, well, I couldn't buy them. And this is a man that has no more tears. And he's telling all these huge things that he spent three days under the rubble, that his wife, he's telling me that his wife is gone, just like that. If I got one reverend to, 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 to take him. That's the kind of things we do for our community. <laughs> He's a Caribbean food, especially with Haitian cuisine. So you say he's, he's the best Haitian joke in New York. By the time of the earthquake in Haiti, you listen for most most news from CNN. In Radio Soleil, in few regions from Haiti, from, from in America, because because of the earthquake, the region Haiti doesn't work. For the community, we have simple problem you see in Haiti is a simple problem here. Uh, no leadership. Everybody is surprised. We think after the earthquake, everything is gonna be Haiti gonna going up. Then it's gonna, for me, it's worse now. Like the community, they support me. They love my food. That's why I make sure I have to be excellent. I love what I'm doing. I have to make sure that I'm doing good. That's why, you know, everybody, my community, they love my food. That's why you said I'm one of the best Asian restaurants in Brooklyn. The piquet, ça fait avec du piment, ça c'est piqué. Il y a encore une fois Jodia, là, pour retourner au dossier de Connecticut, massacre tuerie qui fait dans uh, Sandy uh, Elementary School, et qui... Soleil, bonsoir. Hey, hello, Soleil. Yes. C'est qui, mon? Ici, à même occupé qu'on y a là. They call us for all kinds of problems, all kind of helps. I had um, uh, somebody who, who, who went and take the exam to become an American citizen, and she failed the exam simply because. Uh, she was unfamiliar with the Pledge of Allegiance. And she, she, she called, she was in tears. The call that I received on my cell phone was a person that I called for her, asking for an advice, what does she, she have to do? Because we don't just come here and do news. We do whatever is within our possibility to make life better for, for our people. We are Radio Soleil, and our rencontre de tous les soirs, il oppose à tout de suite. Welcome back. We are now at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism in New York City. And I am with Gary Pierre Pierre, who is a former reporter of the New York Times, who was born in Haiti and who created the Haitian Times here in New York City. Thank you so much, Gary Pierre Pierre, for having Neil. us. Thank you, Neil. pleasure is mine. So, first question can you introduce yourself, your career? You were born in Haiti, you came here when you were 10? Yes. And after a while, you created a Haitian newspaper here. Well, yeah. I mean, first of all, as you said, I was born in Haiti. Uh, I came here very young, uh, and I developed a, a love of journalism. Haiti was under international boycott, embargo, and so obviously the Clinton administration at the time, Bill Clinton, was deeply involved, and it became a front page story. I started covering that story at the Sun Sentinel, and, and my reporting caught the eyes of the editors of the New York Times, who hired me from the Sun Sentinel. And I spent eight years at the New York Times, and then I decided that there was a, the moment for a Haitian American newspaper uh, was, was there. Uh, we were a growing community, we were getting bigger and bigger, because one of the consequences of the embargo was an influx of over 300,000 
refugees to come to the United States. And so that's why I created the Haitian Times. And it's still going on, as, as you know. And I'm one of staff at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, where I am the executive director of the Center for Ethnic and Community Media. So I'm not only working with the Haitian Times, I'm working with 300 publications in New York City. Right after the earthquake here, the community got together and tried to do as much as they could. But in terms of going back there and seeing the devastation, how was it for you and how was it for the people you met here? Well, I mean, it was obviously very uh, touching. I uh, was one of the first reporters to get to Haiti the day after I assembled a team of volunteer reporters and photographers. We flew down to the Dominican Republic and then drove to Haiti. It's about seven hours drive from the capital to capital. And then it was uh, earth shattering, heartbreaking to see the devastation. There were the bodies were still lying on the streets. People were still trapped. And I think the most um, symbolic of this tragedy was the collapse of the palace. Because everybody always thought it was a majestic, gleaming white edifice. So if anything around it was going to collapse, this was going to remain standing. It didn't. And I think that really was symbolic uh, to a lot of people. Wow, even the palace could not be spared from this devastation. It's going to take more time than people think it is. I mean, I always tell people to compare to what happened in New Orleans in 2005. Well, while we all think that New Orleans is fine because we don't hear anything about it, it's not. There's still issues. There's still uh, the, the Lower Ninth Ward, which was the heaviest hit, is still not back on its feet. And it's not because of incompetence of New Orleans or anything. It's just natural disasters, for whatever reason, have a, take a long time to, to get a place back going because it's difficult. And another disaster that happened here in New York City, and that was big here because all the medias were talking about it, is Hurricane Sandy a couple of mm -hmm. months ago. Mm -hmm. And it also happened in Haiti, and we saw the devastation was big there as well, but nobody really talked about this. Well, I wrote a story about that, uh, but that's not unusual. I mean, even before the, the uh, Superstorm Sandy hit here, uh, it seems like every year we have a major hurricane that destroy one city or another in Haiti. Uh, and, and I guess people get fatigued about it, uh, just become numb about the devastation in Haiti. It's just, yeah, 200,000 people died during the earthquake, so if 4,000 died, oh, it's not a big deal. I guess that's, that's the only way I can explain that lack of coverage. How do you see the future for Haiti and how can the community here be involved in helping? The Haitian community in New York, we need to start being smart. We're very emotional when it comes to Haiti. We, we, we throw our money because of my guy. Like I keep, take my mom for example. She, it, she goes to Haiti. At the airport, she sees the poverty and the misery. She wants to give all of her money right there at the airport. And I say, Mom, no, you need to relax. That's not going to solve the problem, OK? And this is a metaphor for how we react towards Haiti. It's a long-term uh, uh, process, and we're just going to be patient about it. Because I, I realized about five or seven years ago, this is a marathon, and we can't sprint to it. Thank you so much. My for, pleasure. Yeah. It was uh, really nice talking to you and, and see really the, the problems from here, from another perspective, and not only from, from Haiti, and also see the, the hope okay. for the future. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much for watching us. Next week, we'll be back in Haiti to bring you more updates on Tucci's rebuilding efforts, and especially at the College Marianne and also at the Kindergarten de Roche. I'm Neil Socant, and I'll see you next week.